In this video, we'll explore the last photos of five tourists with disturbing backstories. Each photo captures a moment before tragedy struck, from mysterious disappearances to fatal accidents. We'll uncover the chilling details behind these final images, showing how an ordinary picture can hide a dark story. Stay tuned to learn about the eerie events that followed these innocent snapshots. It was July 8, 2014, in Varna, Bulgaria. Lars Joachim Mitank, a 28-year-old German tourist, was at Varna Airport. Lars had been enjoying a boy's holiday at the popular Golden Sands Resort with five friends. The trip took a dark turn on July 7, when Lars got into a heated argument with some German nationals, fans of the rival Bundesliga team Bayern Munich at a local bar. This argument escalated into a physical fight. Lars disappeared from the bar that night, leaving his friends unable to find him. He turned up at their hotel the next morning, visibly injured. He claimed he had been beaten by four men, resulting in a cracked jaw and a ruptured eardrum. Lars's injuries were severe enough that a doctor advised him not to fly home with his friends. Despite their insistence on staying with him, Lars reassured them that he would be fine on his own. He checked into the Hotel Kalavana, a budget hotel near the airport, for one night. That evening, Lars's behavior took a disturbing turn. He made a frantic phone call to his mother, Sandra, whispering that he was in danger and that people were trying to kill him. He asked her to cancel his credit cards immediately. Sandra said that she could hear his heart pounding over the phone and she was terrified for her son's safety. Lars' paranoia escalated through the night. CCTV footage from the hotel captured him pacing the hallways, hiding in the elevator and peering out of windows. He left the hotel around 1 a.m. and returned an hour later, but there were no clues as to where he had been. The following day, Lars headed to the airport to fly back to Germany. He was seen on CCTV, acting nervously and looking over his shoulder frequently. At the airport, he visited the airport physician to check if his injuries were healed enough to allow him to fly. During the consultation, a construction worker entered the room. Lars's reaction was immediate and extreme. He stood up abruptly, shouting, I don't want to die here. I have to get out of here. He dropped his backpack containing his passport, phone and wallet, and ran out of the terminal. CCTV captured Lars running through the airport, crossing the car park, and eventually climbing a two-meter fence. He disappeared into the surrounding woodland, and despite extensive searches, he was never seen again. The circumstances of Lars's disappearance have fueled countless theories and speculations. Was he genuinely being pursued, or did his head injury and antibiotics trigger a paranoid episode? Bulgaria is known for its high levels of human trafficking and organized crime, leading some to speculate that he was indeed being chased. However, police investigations have not yielded any concrete evidence to support this theory. Lars's case quickly gained popularity online, with his final moments captured on CCTV becoming a viral sensation. The footage has been viewed millions of times on YouTube, earning him the title of the most famous missing person on YouTube. Internet sleuths and true crime enthusiasts focused on the video, each with their own theories about what happened to Lars. Some believe he fell victim to foul play, while others think he succumbed to a psychotic episode brought on by his injuries and medication. Despite the widespread attention, Lars's case remains unsolved. His family has never given up hope. Sandra, his mother, continues to search for her son, maintaining a Facebook page dedicated to finding Lars and printing thousands of missing person flyers. She believes that Lars may still be alive, but suffering from amnesia. In 2016, there was a potential breakthrough when police in Brazil tweeted a photo of a bearded man walking barefoot along a highway. The image bore a striking resemblance to an age progression photo of Lars. However, it was later revealed that the man was a missing Canadian aid worker. Three years later, in 2019, a German truck driver came forward, claiming to have given a ride to a hitchhiker who resembled an older version of Lars. Unfortunately, this lead also came to nothing. Despite the dead ends and false hopes, Sandra remains steadfast in her search for her son. She continues to believe that Lars will come back one day and that he just needs her help to find his way home. It was May 11, 2011, in Aurora, Illinois. Six-year-old Timothy James Pitson began his day as usual. His father, Jim, dropped him off at Greenman Elementary School. Known for his smile and curiosity, Timothy was a lively boy. However, his routine abruptly changed when his mother, Amy Fry Pitson, picked him up at 8.10 a.m., claiming a family emergency. What followed shattered a family and left Timothy missing. Amy took Timothy on an unplanned trip. Over three days, they visited amusement parks, zoos and water parks in Illinois and Wisconsin. On May 12th, they were seen at the Brookfield Zoo and later checked into the Key Lime Cove Resort in Gurney. 
Surveillance footage on May 13th showed them at the Kalahari Resort in Wisconsin Dells, where Timothy was last seen smiling in the pool. On May 13th, Amy called family members around noon, assuring them they were safe. Timothy was heard saying he was hungry during one call. Cell phone records indicated these calls were made near Route 40, northwest of Sterling, Illinois. Later that day, Amy was alone on security cameras at a family dollar store in Winnebago, Illinois, at 7.30 p.m., purchasing a pen, notepaper, and envelopes. At 8 p.m., she was seen alone again at Sullivan's Food Store in Winnebago. By 11.15 p.m., she checked into the Rockford Inn in Rockford, Illinois. That night, or early the next morning, Amy took her own life by slashing her wrists and neck and overdosing on antihistamines. A maid found Amy's body at 12.30 p.m. on May 14th. Beside her was a note apologizing for the mess and stating that Timothy was safe with someone who would care for him, but that he would never be found. This note only deepened the mystery. Where was Timothy? And who had him? Amy's cell phone records showed she drove about 170 miles along the Rock River towards Sterling before turning off her phone. She had made two prior trips to Sterling in February and March 2011, which she never mentioned to anyone. The purpose of these trips remains unknown. Timothy's family clung to hope. His father, Jim, and grandmother, Linda, never stopped searching. Over the years, many theories and potential sightings emerged, but none led to Timothy. One theory suggested Amy had arranged for Timothy's adoption through an illegal network, possibly ensuring he would be raised in a manner she preferred, perhaps in a religious commune. This idea gained traction due to Amy's Mormon upbringing and her desire to see Timothy raised in a similar environment. Hannah Sukup, a childhood friend of Timothy's, believed he might be in a secluded Mormon community, unaware of his true identity. Timothy's grandmother, Linda, supported this theory, thinking Amy's actions were driven by her religious beliefs and her reluctance to face another divorce. Amy's cryptic behavior and final note only added to the chilling uncertainty surrounding Timothy's fate. The last images of Amy and Timothy together were from the Kalahari Resort, showing a happy mother and son. By the time Amy was seen alone in Winnebago, Timothy had vanished. The discovery of Amy's body in the Rockford Inn only deepened the mystery. Police found grass, dirt, and traces of blood in her car, later determined to be from a nosebleed Timothy had suffered months earlier. Despite extensive searches and numerous tips, Timothy's whereabouts remain unknown. Investigators explored many possibilities, including the idea that Amy handed Timothy to someone before taking her own life. The lack of evidence and the cryptic note kept the case open for over a decade. In 2014, hope flickered when a woman in northern Illinois reported seeing a boy resembling Timothy. But this lead, like many others, led nowhere. The most bizarre twist came in 2019, when a 14-year-old boy from Cincinnati claimed to be Timothy. The boy's DNA did not match, and he was later identified as Brian Reaney, a 25-year-old man with a history of impersonating others. The search for Timothy included analyzing debris from Amy's SUV, which did not match dirt in northern Illinois. Experts hoped this could pinpoint where Amy handed Timothy to someone, but it yielded no answers. Despite the years, Jim and his family remain hopeful. Jim believes his son is out there, perhaps living off the grid, unaware of his true identity. It was January 11, 2007, when 38-year-old Australian adventurer Andrew McCauley embarked on his greatest challenge, a solo kayak journey across the Tasman Sea from Australia to New Zealand. Known for his daring nature and love for extreme adventures, Andrew was an experienced mountaineer and sea kayaker with numerous dangerous feats under his belt. This journey, however, would be his most dangerous and ultimately his last. Andrew was born on August 7, 1968 in Goulburn, New South Wales. Growing up in Queensland with his brother Michael, he was known for his fearless personality, engaging in activities like swimming, tree climbing, and cliff diving. This adventurous streak continued into adulthood, leading him to seek out increasingly thrilling challenges. In the late 1990s, during a mountaineering trip in Patagonia, Andrew discovered his passion for kayaking. A sudden storm forced him and his friends to navigate through the Chilean fjords by kayak, sparking his interest in the sport. From then on, he tackled progressively harder kayaking challenges, including a direct, non-stop crossing of the Bass Strait in 2003, which took 35 hours to complete. Another notable achievement was his nearly 330-mile trip across the Gulf of Carpentaria in northern Australia, a journey that took him a week. His efforts earned him the Australian Geographic Society's Adventurer of the Year Award in 2005. With such a strong track record, many believed Andrew would succeed in crossing the Tasman Sea. 
This dangerous stretch of water between Australia and New Zealand had defeated all previous attempts, but Andrew was determined to be the first to conquer it. Andrew's first attempt in December 2006 was aborted after just one night due to freezing conditions that led to hypothermia. Undeterred, he modified his equipment and set off again on January 11, 2007, with a specially insulated Mirage kayak designed for sleeping inside. This 19-foot kayak, equipped with a yellow fiberglass canopy nicknamed Casper, was meant to protect him during rough storms and allow him to sleep inside. As he went on his journey, Andrew kept in regular contact with his friends and family through photos and videos. In one early recording, he expressed a mix of excitement and nervousness, saying, It's an excellent adventure, provided I make it. It's more full-on than I could imagine. I just hope I haven't bitten off more than I can chew. Nearly a month into his trip, Andrew faced a brutal storm off the coast of New Zealand. He spent over 27 hours inside his kayak, enduring relentless waves that forced his vessel into multiple barrel rolls and submerged it nearly 30 feet underwater. Despite these harrowing conditions, he emerged from the storm, though his kayak sustained significant damage. On February 8, 2007, Andrew sent a message to his wife, Vicky, stating, See you 9 a.m. Sunday. His family and friends eagerly prepared for his arrival at Milford Sound, New Zealand, planning a small celebration with a bottle of whiskey and ginger beer. However, Andrew never made it to shore. On February 9th, the New Zealand Coast Guard received a scrambled, incoherent radio message. Initially believed to be a routine check-in, the message was later deciphered to contain the words help and sinking. A search party was dispatched on February 10th. That evening, they found Andrew's upturned kayak about 34 miles from Milford Sound. The kayak was largely intact, with only some cosmetic damage, but Andrew was nowhere to be found. His paddle, phone, GPS tracker, and emergency radio were all inside the kayak, but the canopy, Casper, was missing. The search continued until February 12th, when it was called off. Andrew McCauley was presumed dead, and his family and friends were left to grapple with the mystery of his disappearance. Many theories emerged about what could have happened. Paul Hewitson, the maker of Andrew's kayak, speculated that Andrew might have capsized while Casper was not properly secured, causing the kayak to fill with water and separate from Andrew. Other theories suggested that a rogue wave could have struck, leading to Andrew's separation from the kayak. Despite the extensive search and recovery of his gear, Andrew's body was never found. On February 26, 2007, a memorial service was held for Andrew at Sydney's Macquarie Lighthouse, overlooking the Tasman Sea. Around 400 friends and family members gathered to celebrate his life and achievements. During the service, Andrew's chilling last words were shared. I may have bitten off more than I can chew. On September 11, 2014, three-year-old William Tyrrell traveled with his foster family from Sydney to visit his foster grandmother in Kendall, New South Wales. The next morning, William was playing hide-and-seek with his five-year-old sister in the yard of his grandmother's house on Benaroon Drive. Around 10 a.m., William's foster mother went inside to make a cup of tea leaving William and his sister outside. When she returned, William was gone. Despite a thorough search by police, emergency services and volunteers, no trace of William was found. At 10.57 a.m., William's foster mother reported him missing, and the New South Wales police arrived shortly after. The last sound she remembered was William imitating a tiger's roar before he vanished. Investigations revealed that two cars were seen near the house that morning, but no significant leads emerged from this. The case known as Strike Force Roseanne, involved many searches, including extensive forensic operations, but William's fate remains unknown. The NSW government offered a $1 million reward for information, the largest in the state's history, but the case remains unresolved. The investigation took several turns. On November 17, 2021, police named William's foster mother and foster grandmother as persons of interest. They started to investigate the theory that William might have died accidentally from a fall, and they began excavating the foster grandmother's property. Crucial items were found and sent for forensic testing, but the results are still pending. In April 2022, William's foster mother was charged with providing false information to the NSW Crime Commission. However, she was found not guilty in November 2022. By June 2023, police recommended potential charges against her for obstructing justice and tampering with a corpse. They suspect that William may have died accidentally and that she covered it up. The inquest into William's disappearance began in 2018 and ran for 18 months before it was adjourned in October 2020. Deputy State Coroner Harriet Graham's findings were expected in June 2021, but were delayed due to fresh police investigations. These new investigations included intensive searches around Kendall 
In late 2021, in mid-2023, detectives handed a brief of evidence to the Director of Public Prosecutions, recommending charges against William's foster mother. As of early 2024, the DPP was still deciding whether to charge her. The inquest is now set to resume later this year with more hearings. During the investigation, attention also turned to other individuals. In the early stages, police focused on William Spedding, a washing machine repairman who had visited William's foster grandparents' house shortly before the boy vanished. Spedding was publicly named a prime suspect, and police pursued him over historical child sex offences from the 1980s. However, these charges were later found to be unfounded, and Spedding had an airtight alibi for the day William disappeared. He was acquitted of the charges in 2018, but the damage to his reputation and life was significant. As the investigation continued, police circled back to William's foster parents. They obtained warrants to plant listening devices in their home, hoping to gather evidence. The police's public theory suggested that William might have fallen from a balcony and that his foster mother disposed of his body. She has denied any involvement in William's disappearance and urged the police to focus on finding the real culprits. The case has seen many developments and theories over the years, but William Tyrrell remains missing. His foster parents have persistently denied any wrongdoing. The inquest is set to continue and the search for answers goes on. It was October 19th, 2023, and 29-year-old Nancy Ang was thrilled for her second trip to Lake Atitlan, Guatemala. Nancy, a special needs teacher from Monterey Park, California, was attending the Be The Change Yoga Retreat, a trip she enjoyed the previous year. She anticipated peace and tranquility, but instead faced mystery and tragedy. Nancy's family last heard from her on October 14th, when she confirmed her safe arrival in Guatemala and planned to put her phone on airplane mode. Five days later, Nancy vanished during a kayaking trip, leaving her family with unanswered questions. On the morning of October 19th, Nancy joined 10 others from the yoga retreat for a kayaking adventure on Lake Atitlan. They rented kayaks and paddleboards from Kayak Guatemala, owned by Lee and Elaine Beal. Initially, conditions were perfect, with calm waters and clear skies. The Beals said the group stayed together at first, but Nancy and another woman, Christina Blazek, paddled further into the lake. Blazek, a public defender from San Bernardino County, was the last to see Nancy. The weather turned, causing choppy waters and strong currents. Blazek warned Nancy not to swim, but Nancy ignored her, entered the water and pushed her kayak away. Blazek tried to retrieve Nancy's kayak, but lost sight of her. Blazek paddled back to shore for help. A distress signal was sent, but it was too late. Nancy had disappeared beneath Lake Atitlan's waters. Nancy's family was informed by the retreat organizer and flew to Guatemala immediately. They contacted local police, prosecutors, and hired a private search and rescue team to search the lake. Despite efforts from local fire and rescue teams, the FBI, and a private search company, no trace of Nancy was found. Nancy's family found the silence from the other retreat participants frustrating. The Beals noted that the group left Guatemala within 12 hours of Nancy's disappearance, not even paying for their kayak rentals. This behavior puzzled both the Beals and Nancy's family. Blazek's attorney, Chris Gardner, claimed Blazek did everything possible to help, speaking with Guatemalan police and providing a detailed account. However, Nancy's family struggled to verify this as they couldn't find any record of Blazek's statement. The family tried contacting Blazek multiple times, but she remained silent until nearly a month after Nancy's disappearance. Through her attorney, she claimed trauma and needed time to process the incident. New allegations surfaced during the investigation. The Eng family hired a Guatemalan attorney and suspected a bribe led to the omission of Blazek's statement from official records. Gardner dismissed these allegations, saying Blazek left on a regularly scheduled flight due to road closures and civil unrest in Guatemala. He insisted Blazek had been cooperative. Nancy's family couldn't understand why Blazek hadn't shared details sooner, believing it could have aided the search efforts significantly. The investigation revealed serious safety concerns about Kayak Guatemala. Multiple participants, including Blazek and another anonymous attendee, claimed the company provided no life jackets or safety instructions. Elaine Beale insisted life jackets were offered, but declined by the group. Participants, however, said no life jackets were visible or offered. The anonymous participant recalled feeling rushed and uneasy, noting a lack of safety briefings or instructions on maneuvering their watercraft. They also mentioned a language barrier, contributing to the lack of safety communication. Despite conflicting accounts and silent witnesses, a timeline of Nancy's final day was established. The group set out in the morning, and Nancy and Blazek separated from the main group. The last sighting of Nancy was her admiring the view, confident in her kayak. Nancy's family continued their search, 
employing every available resource. They planned to return to Lake Atitlan with an underwater vehicle and a cadaver dog for a grid search. Despite their relentless efforts, they were left with more questions than answers. The Eng family was determined to find closure, despite the risks involved. They couldn't understand why Blazek and other participants hadn't stayed to help narrow the search area. The silence and lack of cooperation from witnesses only deepened their pain.